we don't want to be losing money to piracy like that that's that's a, that's a given we we all have you know rent to pay and we have bills and we have to you know feed ourselves um but for your career there is a there is a balancing thing of obscurity yeah if somebody shares it and they shouldn't you know bad on them but if they share it then that other person is you know possibly now into what you do and they might go out and buy your you know your next scores and you know and you know evangelize for you and that could be that could lead to more sales and, and maybe some commissions. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm thrilled to have on the podcast today, Dennis Tobensky, who I've known for the last year or so and have just fallen in love with his wonderful show, The Music Publishing Podcast. In addition to hosting this podcast, Dennis is himself a composer and a vocalist. And as you'll see from this interview, we have a weirdly large amount of things in common. So we're going to dive right into this conversation. It was such a good time. And I want to give a shout out to our two sponsors for this episode. We got the Upton Bass String Instrument Shop. And did you know that Upton makes a model that Gary Carr plays? How cool is that? It's the Gary Carr model bass, the only commercially made bass that Gary Carr endorses. And it was important to Gary that they keep the entry level price attainable for everybody. Gary wanted anyone coming to his car camp to be able to afford one. So the 2009 silver medal in tone, that went to the Carr model bass from Upton. It's played by Gary Carr, but it's also played by a bunch of past podcast guests, including David Murray, and Craig Butterfield and lots of other folks on the podcast have played and do play Upton, including Mark Ramirez and David White. Learn more about them at UptonBass.com. And thank you also to the Bass Violin Shop, which offers the Southeast's largest inventory of basses. And they do professional setups, repairs, and restorations at reasonable prices. They specialize in resetting necks, repairing cracks, installing new fingerboards, new bass bars, and custom C extensions. So whatever your playing needs, the Bass Violin Shop will work hard to get the most out of your instrument without blowing your budget. You can check them out at BassViolinShop.com. Okay, we're diving into this conversation with Dennis. So much fun. I know you're going to love this. Here we go. Well, actually, let's just start with the quick, like, Dennis Tobensky, like, where, like, how you got to where you are, maybe in, you know, five minutes or less. Go. Like, who, who is Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 you know, as a musician, where'd you grow up? And, like, what are you doing right now? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, yeah, Dennis Tabensky, composer, vocalist, uh, amongst many other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, originally from Kankakee, Illinois, hey, the middle of a cornfield. Sure. Um, and yeah, just sort of started, you know, young like we all do, mm-hmm. um, as a as a violist for for some reason. Um, well, I know I know why my parents wouldn't let me play the violin, and they because it was too squeaky, and they wouldn't let me play the cello because it was too big. There we to, go to cart around. <laughs> 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 um, that yeah, ended up uh, getting into composing later on. Uh, did my undergrad at Illinois State University. Um, did you know double major there in vocal performance and uh, music theory and composition. Mm-hmm. Uh, totally had no. I got, I, I remember in high school saying, I'm going to be a, an accounting major and a viola performance minor. And I do not remember the moment when that plan got scrapped and I was suddenly <laughs> like a voice major. It just, it just, it happened somehow. It, it was one of those weird things. And then within a semester I said, you know, I want, I really like composing. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to pursue this. So I added it in the you know, beginning of my, my first semester of, of undergrad, um, finished that applied to grad schools. Um, no one like as wonderful as Illinois state university is, I adore that school and I adore everyone there. Um, nobody really helped me with my grad school applications. Oh, yeah. so, um, you know, my, my portfolio was an absolute wreck. It was horrible. You know, I was applying as a, as a composer mm-hmm. to, you know, all the big schools, um, and so my, the scores that I sent were s- printed out single sided and paper clipped together. 
and I sent that out, you know, I sent that to Juilliard. That that went over well. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard back from them except no, thank you. Um, and so I didn't get into, you know, didn't get into any grad schools right away. Um, but knew a composer who lived in New York, and he, um, you know, I'd had a private lesson with him when he visited ISU, and you might hear my cat meowing in the background he's very lonely oh, right now <laughs> I, I have I, I can't tell you how many podcasts i uh, have cats walking through them and a lot of my pr- my episodes you'll hear like a little thump on the table and that, <laughs> that's the cat coming to visit yeah so i, nice. I, I <laughs> not, not the first time <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, I closed the door so pistachio couldn't come in and uh you know be Pistachio's right on happy top. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but the, the, this, this composer in new york i i you know emailed him and said, Hey, you know, what do I do? And he said, I have an opening in my studio in the fall. There's this composer who's, you know, getting his master's at Juilliard. So when he leaves the studio, you should take his spot. And I was like, great, I will. Um, so I, you know, loomed up the truck and moved to, (laughs) moved to New York. Um, and, uh, just, yeah, just, I've been working, ever since as a, as a composer and a singer here in, in New York city. Okay. I, I got so many, so many questions and we have a lot of probably mutual acquaintances from just your path. You know, I like long time, <laughs> long time sh- Chicago resident, me- Metro Chicago. I, I, I guess I'm now started. I, I'm almost a year in San Francisco. I think that qualifies you. Pe- people call themselves local after just a little bit of time. So, but anyway, a yeah. cu- couple of former like Metro Chicagoans. So Illinois state, there is a f- first question I got. There is a, the base professor there is also into composing and improv and really kind of interesting guy, Bill Kohler. Did you have any contact yeah. with Bill? Okay. Not a ton. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I went to, um, he had a, I remember a really fantastic recital that he did while I was there. And, yeah. you know, it was a, just a ton of new music. Um, I think maybe, maybe something of his own. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, yeah, I didn't have a ton of contact with him, but he was, uh, he was, cool and everybody really liked him (laughs) yeah no absolutely yeah interesting guy he's somebody i've i must have a a half dozen times at least bill and i have said we got to do a podcast episode Mm -hmm. and it's we're we're coming up on over a decade and haven't done it yet but (laughs) one of the one of these days did uh what year did you graduate from illinois state uh 2004 four okay so that was before because they they've They've really become a power. They've always been a good school for music education, but they yes. Joe Manfredo is teaching at Illinois State now. He was at University of Illinois and and just okay. a wonderful wind ensemble director and music ed person. Just such okay, a yeah. so he's had a real influence on me in a very circuitous way he's a mm-hmm. uh, in the band world but i've learned so much like watching him and interacting with him and i've been yeah. down to illinois state to give some talks and oh, nice. so i'm sure we know a lot of people okay so i'm the next question okay mm-hmm. kankakee normal illinois mm-hmm. moved to new york city what yep. what was that experience like um it was a little you know, it was one of those things that, you know, it just sort of happened mm-hmm. and I, I tend to take stuff in, in stride, but yeah, I, I went from like growing up in the middle of a cornfield, yeah. you know, 18 years there, four years in, in normal, which is still, you know, I mean, it's, it's a city, mm-hmm. um, uh, fa- fairly liberal for, yeah. for, for sure. central Illinois. Sure. Um, so a little bit unusual in that respect, uh, which was kind of nice for me. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, it, New York was a huge change of pace, but it seemed so natural for me. Okay. You know, I was always a, a fast walker and a fast talker. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> like, I sort of, like, I, I got here. Um, yeah, my parents just, like, we, we packed up as much as we could in their SUV, drove out here. They dropped me off at the apartment that I was, you know, renting with two, like, friends of a friend who I'd never met. Yeah. And, and then it was just like, okay, go. So it was like, quick, you know, my second day out, um, or I say, yeah, my, my second day out here, um, I, I had a, a job interview at a temp agency, but that, that night it had rained so heavily that the subways had flooded. Oh, <laughs> so I ended up walking, you know, to this job interview. It is so, it was like hot and humid from having rained. I walked from 148th and Broadway all the way down to 
37th and 5th. Wow, okay. <laughs> I called the agency and I said, hey guys, um, I'm coming, but the subway, I mean, you know what's going on with the subway better than I do. I just know I can't get to you, so I'll be there. And they're like, get here when you get here. And I walked <laughs> in like just sweaty and disgusting and, uh, you know, I... They placed me the next day. They said, you're dedicated <laughs> if you walked this far. <laughs> but that, yeah, but then after that, it was just like kind of head down and do it. Yeah, yeah. Of just, you know, writing music. I, I was taking private lessons with this composer um, and just said, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've managed to make it work for 12 years now. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, it's a, so you were the, you were ready for New York City. I mean, that was just like a natural progression. It sounds like yeah, sure. it, yeah. it was. Yeah. You know, right before I left, um, you know, I was in the grocery store with my mom, and somebody was asking about about everything. You know, oh, the, the move and blah, blah, blah. and they asked me, oh, did you know? So has this been like a lifelong dream for you? And I and I was like, no, um, just it's what's happening. Yeah. And then my mom said, you know, I've always known he'd move out there. <laughs> I was like, okay, glad that everybody knows things about me that I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I got, I got a lot of similar comments uh, when I was or, or, or moving to San Francisco now, like people would, mm -hmm. my, my wife would describe to people what I do. Oh, is it into podcasting and new media, blah, blah, blah. This is this. And they're like, well, why didn't he move out here 10 years ago? You know, it's like, of course he's like West coast guy, my hairstyle. I look, I go into a, a bar and like, like, I'm indistinguishable. I look just like every other guy in there, like, you know, <laughs> wearing my hipster t-shirt and my man bun. And like, I, so the, the West Coast suits me well too. But man, I love that there's that East Coast, just in the best sense of the word, that East Coast energy and hustle mm -hmm. and like, it's a, okay. and that's so, that's something that I, I love so much. Chicago has a bit of that, you know, like mm -hmm. mix in a little Midwesterniness to that East Coast. But I, yeah. but that's, that's such a, such a cool environment. Environment, and such a different environment from either uh, any West Coast city, really, but like San Francisco mm -hmm. or Los Angeles, just a yeah. diff different energy. It's funny how different parts of the country, different cities have that sort of different energy to them. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's cool. Like I, I, at this point, I can't imagine living anywhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, after 12 years, it, <laughs> right. I'm, right. I'm definitely a New Yorker. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, when, when did you start your podcast? I started, um, let's see, this is March. So I started 10 months ago. Okay. Okay. Almost to the day. When did the idea come to you? Like, was there a, or do you remember the moment that where you thought I should do a podcast? That's the next move for me. It had been, so I, I launched in May of 2016 mm -hmm. and I had the idea in the summer of 2015. Okay. I had been listening to the self-publishing podcast, which is all about like, you know, publishing your own books. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I'm really into book culture and, and author culture. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really want to, I want to write a book. Um, and so researching that, um, led me to, sort of down this path and this, this, this show, it's three, three hosts, uh, three full-time authors that they get together once a week and, you know, frequently have guests. And I just loved the vibe of the show. I loved what they were doing. And I said, I want to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I had been writing, um, to back up a bit, like from 2012 to 2015, I had been writing these blog posts on my site called the composer's guide to doing business. And it was all, you know, just teaching some basic business stuff to, to musicians in general, but composers you know, yeah. particularly. And, um, in 2015 I stopped mm -hmm. it, it. It got to be, you know, writing these posts and, you know, crafting them and all that. It was too similar to composing, like to my process there. Sure. And it, it used, you know, the same parts of the brain at times. And so I said, I, I have to like pull back on this. And I stopped writing those and, and thought, wait, a podcast. I don't have to write. I just have to like show up and talk to people. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. perfect. That's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And so I had this like, dream of having two co-hosts and doing a, something really in the style of a self-publishing podcast with like 20 minutes of screwing around in the beginning and you know it, you know talking about things but really not getting going for a while and then finally coming to the topic so yeah. there's this sense of like camaraderie and you know having fun uh, i had two co-hosts that i was like 
tap it. I was like, hey, you, like, do you want to do this? Yes. Do you want to do this? Yes. And then both of them pulled out. Mm. They said, you know, I'm too busy. Right. You know, like, I, you know, I, I really, I love the idea. I, I wish I could do it. I'm, I'm going to be traveling a lot or, or my, my life is just insane. So I, uh, you know, I kind of tabled it for a few months and then, um, so that was like November, 2015. And then March, um, I had a really bad day. I had a really horrible, horrible day. Like I got bad news from a commissioner that like they were going to, they, they weren't going to be able to like pay me Mm -hmm. what they thought. And it was going to be really, really like nothing. And yeah, there's some other bad news. It was just a, I had a really down day yeah. and I, like went, went, went for a big long walk, went to the bar, <laughs> ha, you know, had a drink. My husband met me there and we were sort of talking through all of this and, and just, I, I kind of broke down in the bar. I think I cried a little bit and he said, you know what? You're the most capable person I know. You need to do this podcast. Like, I know that's not what's go like, that's not what's going through your head right now, but this is what you need to do. So do it. And I just like that the next day I had a a whole new business plan and (laughs) I ran with it. Wow. Wow. That's uh, it's amazing how those dark, uh, dark days are like, like those like low frustration moments. Like you look back Mm -hmm. and you realize like, wow, that was like an amazing, an amazing, I've had several of those in my own, my own life for sure. Yeah. I, you know, Sometimes those, yeah, those dark moments, like you have to spring back somehow. Right. And it can be like, all right, it's a new project Mm -hmm. and it's something I'm really excited about. And the exciting, one of the exciting things is how do I make this work? Yeah. I have to change my whole concept of, of what I wanted and I have to make it work on my own. It's interesting that that model, the three co- co-host models, you know, my model, cheesy as it is, was like This American Life, That's, which mm. my podcast doesn't resemble This American Life at all. <laughs> but I had, I, I, I so wanted to make a show like that with little musical, like me saying some quippy sort of, in, mm-hmm. you know, Ira Glass-ish thing, and then going <laughs> to another clip. And there was a podcast that I don't, I think it's been gone for years, or I haven't listened to it for mm. a while, called The Bitterest Pill by Dan mm. Class. Wonderful podcast, very sort of arty a little mm-hmm. sardonic, which my podcast is not at all really. So it's sort of weird that these are my models. Um, and I, my very first episode, you can sort of see like a very lame attempt at trying to do that. <laughs> this American life. Like I say something and then like a little music comes in and I, and Oh, it's so uh, not that I go back and listen to that over and over, but like the couple times I have, it's like, man, mm-hmm. that's painful to, to listen to. <laughs> did how, okay. So you've been doing it, you've been going like the better part of a year now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's, how going maybe going back to your first episode like what's changed for you between where you are now and that first episode like how how has your vision of it changed if at all um there hasn't i I feel like it it, there's been a very very slow evolution um i think the vibe is still really very similar Mm -hmm. um because my show is just very conversational um i People keep saying that I'm a really good interviewer and I don't believe them because <laughs> I don't because f- I don't feel like I'm interviewing people yeah. on my show. Right. I mean, I am absolutely asking them questions and, and sort of leading them to to say the things that I want them to say. But, um, you know, to me, it's really like my whole idea ha- has been from the start, even though it, it, in practice it doesn't always like it's not this literally. But I like the idea of sort of sitting down with someone with a drink mm-hmm. and just talking and and, you know maybe yeah. about like a particular topic. Um, definitely the audio quality has gotten better. <laughs> I think it can get better yet, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a big improvement over the, the first episode. I was, you know, obviously like I, I didn't spend a lot of time. I'm a really big believer in just go. Yeah. Like just start something and figure it out. Um, it can suck at first. It's fine. Yep. And, um, I think I think one thing that hasn't with the with the idea of like the vibe not changing, I th- I think my comfort level has hasn't been a, a big difference because I think I started out fairly comfortable because mm-hmm. I started with people that I knew. Yeah, I mean I knew I could have a conversation with them and you know didn't feel self conscious about saying the things that I would say to these people over a drink in front of how many you know listeners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely like audio quality has gotten better. I've sort of. I have felt a little bit more comfortable as an interviewer mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, bringing new people I don't know onto the show and, 
and, you know, drawing stuff out of them and, and pivoting Mm -hmm. when I realize that they're not going to say what I want them to say. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's, you are a good interviewer, by the way, like like that, but like, I, I like listening to the way that you, like, we probably spent a lot of time thinking about similar, you know, I I totally identify with everything you're saying in terms of like, like, I I hate the word, I don't hate it, but the the word interview always kind of bothers me. I love the idea of conversation. That's why I even like call the podcast that. And I, I think that some of the best interviewers I've using that word again, but, uh, that I've (laughs) like studs turn. Circle is a great example. If you're familiar with mm-hmm. Stud Circle, Working, and all those mm-hmm. great books, he, he, uh, he described it very similarly. Like the best interview is more like a conversation than anything. Yeah. Then you're maybe in the driver's seat a tad more, but mm-hmm. I totally have that same image that you do. It's the sort of conversation I'd want to be having anyway, right? With yeah. somebody, and it's so easy yeah. to start like with your fr- like. Well, I still think until maybe the last couple of years, one of my best episodes was my first episode ever because it mm-hmm. was with a really good friend at his mm-hmm. house and just very conversational. And I think nice. I kind of clamped up with the when like you were saying like when the uh people that you don't know as well come on the show mm-hmm. like how do you how do you get into that kind of easygoing flow that you have with someone that maybe you haven't met before that you're doing a podcast with um well i i have a little like well i, I call it my welcome packet did uh-huh. i did i send you that when i i i, I have to look back i, I feel sometimes like i came in the my email i i'm yeah sure, yeah Sometimes I, I send it and sometimes I forget. I have a, I have like a, a single page on my website mm-hmm. that just sort of says, here's what you can expect in terms of the vibe. And, you know, like, I swear like a sailor. So, <laughs> you know, if, if you have a problem with that, let me know. Yeah. Because, you know, and I, I'll try to like mimic your language. You know, if you're keeping it clean, I'll try to keep it clean yeah, and not dr- yeah. drop the F-bomb every other word like right. I would, you know, just like in a, everyday life. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, you know, I, so I, I try to put them at their ease just right away by saying this is going to be relaxed and groovy. Like, mm-hmm. that's what I want. And then I make a point of not starting the recording right away. Yeah. You know, like I, I want like five, 10, 15 minutes just to say like, hi, how are you? And kind of how is your day? And just start to have a human conversation yeah. and like, I can hear their voice. They can hear mine. There's, you know, video involved at least, you know, for us, I don't publish the video anymore, but that way there's, you know, the whole visual, like I can see your facial expressions and and we can just sort of start to have that conversation. And then I'll start to say, okay, so I kind of want to cover X, Y, and Z, maybe roughly in this order, we'll play it by ear. And then, you know, we hit record and go. Mm -hmm. So we've already established a a bit of a rapport and and have a sense of how things are going to kind of work. What was the name of that? Po- I gotta, I gotta write this down so I, because I'm fine. I, I, the idea of publishing general, I find interesting too. So mm-hmm. the self, was it the self publishing podcast? Self, yeah, self publishing podcast. Okay, okay, cool. Is those guys? Um, like I, I just, I, I have having had them in my ears for a couple of years now. I, I'm like in love with them, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they, they actually have a network of like, I think right now it's eight active podcasts. Okay. Wow. That, that they do in addition to all of their writing and and everything else. It's kind of insane. Um, but they do it really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so interesting to, see like you know like I, for me i do these every week i talk to people every week and i don't necessarily notice myself getting better like it's mm-hmm. just like practicing or working out yeah. or whatever right but then like going back and listening and just realize like, like wow i have gotten better you know it's mm-hmm. and it's 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 interesting and one thing that i did at, at a certain point i decided to actually like focus on really sort of like analyzing some of my favorite uh, mm. podcast like, yeah. like you with the self publishing podcast and I, i'd be curious outside of that podcast is there anybody else that you've you've sort of studied to like like other models mm-hmm. that, that you like either podcast or any, anything else to just sort of develop that craft of interviewing um i mean there are a couple other shows that i've, I've i listen to again sort of all about 
um, typically about publishing books, yeah. um, like rocking self publishing. Okay. Um, I, I liked that for a while. Um, it's not that I don't like it now. It's just, there are too many things to listen to. And yeah, so that one right. sort of followed to the wayside, uh, the creative pen, uh, that, that, that's a good one too. Uh, and you know, they have, they're similarly relaxed, mm -hmm. like, you know, like the self publishing podcast. So my, my whole input in, in this for like, I don't, I don't listen to the NPR podcasts. I, you know, I know that a lot of them are cool. You know, there are a lot of like great podcasts out there. My husband listens to just a ton of them. He loves, um, pod save America and, um, uh, uh the Mike Mar Mark Marin, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, who's the other one? Um, waking up with Sam Harris, you know, he, okay. li he likes those and, and they're a little bit more, they're, they're cleaner. Mm -hmm. They're, they're a little bit more structured. Um, and those don't come into my ears. So <laughs> they, they, so my whole thing is just like, I, I just hear all of this relaxed and grooviness. Yeah. And, and so I don't know that I really, it, it's, it's all kind of passive learning. Yeah. Sure. Of, of not really saying like, I'm going to make a point of learning, you know, getting better at this thing. It's like, I, I know that with time I will continue to improve. And if I keep bring, you know, pulling, putting the sorts of things that I want to do into my head, mm -hmm. then it'll, it'll sort of rub off. Yeah. I, I yeah. I, I think for me too, a lot of it is passive because I, I have podcasts mm -hmm. on all, during a big portion of the day. I actually have started like trying to actually turn everything off and have a few moments where I just don't have, it's almost yeah. like that, you know, like <laughs> actually try to, you know, f f focus on one thing for at least like a minute a day, you know, mm -hmm. without, uh, but I, well, so something I'd, I'd be fascinated to dig into and your podcast called the music publishing podcast. And then you listen to these self publishing podcasts. And I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love to just, maybe we could talk a little bit about, maybe we could start with book publishing versus mm -hmm. publishing music and like what's what how those two worlds are similar and different maybe it's kind of an open-ended topic but you probably thought about that <laughs> oh my god let me let me put on my lecturer's cap <laughs> i uh i know a ridiculous amount about how yeah. it works um with with Publishing books, I mean, one of the, the interesting things is when you like, you know, you finish your book um, and if you don't, if you don't want to publish it yourself, you know, if you want to go through a traditional publisher, you um, um, stop me if I like bore you with, <laughs> with any of this, um, because I, I will go into the weeds. Um, you, you know, you go to, to a you know, publisher, to an, to an editor there and, you know, you can go through an agent and that can be really trying. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of the advice that I, I hear is actually like kind of avoid that in many ways because um, agents are kind of, they should be regulated, but they're not. Okay. Um, because they're, they're like negotiating your contracts for you typically, like mo typically like you as the author are, unless you're comfortable with it, you're not, doing the, the negotiations with a, with a publisher, um, if, if you're having your agent do it. And so they're, they're doing all this like legal stuff, but they don't, but they're all like former English majors. They don't have any background in the law. So it's really weird that they're kind of practicing law without any background in it. And so I, I hear a lot of like, kind of avoid that. Um, and also, they're very much kind of in bed with the publishers. Like everybody wants to keep each other happy. So you're maybe not going to get the best deal, but what, you know, when your book is like picked up, um, like the contract sort of, it states that you're not like selling them the book. You're licensing the book, like in the English language in North America. And it is for the life of the copyright, unless you, you know, buy it back from them. But it's a very, you're sort of giving them a slice of the pie, not the whole pie so that, you know, and, and maybe it's just for print rights and it's not digital. Um, so you can go to all of the other territories in the world and they're like these established publishing territories. Um, and you can sell the, your, the same book in English in the UK, mm -hmm. you know, and just do print rights there, just do, you know, e-publishing rights there and then you can translate it to French and do it, you know, European French language rights and 
so it, it, it you just have, you keep slicing up the pie. Um, whereas with music, when you go with a traditional publisher, you sell the pie, you give the whole pie away. It's worldwide rights in all formats and you no longer own the piece. So if you like, if you write a string quartet and you want to turn it, you want to arrange it uh, for a, to turn it into a piano piece, you have to get your publisher's permission to do that. Oh, okay. And they big. can tell you no. Okay, that's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. You know, like, there, there's just so much, there's so many major differences. And, you know, when it comes to self-publishing, there's a lot of similarity in, in the way that you do it, that, you know, you you set up your company, and it, it can be as formal or informal as you want. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can either, you know, with music, you're probably going to sell it on your own website and maybe a couple of other distributors that are self-publisher friendly. Um, whereas with, you know, publishing books and things, you have Amazon. Yes. <laughs> you have like yeah. this behemoth that, you, mm-hmm. that will take your stuff and you're like, so long as your cover is good and your product description is good and, you know, you kind of check the boxes of looking professional uh nobody cares nobody right. cares who published the, your your book uh you know if so long as you know you don't have typos your your cover is appropriate to the genre and all that sort of stuff with music still nobody cares but there's not that discoverability engine yeah you know amazon you you want to look for thrillers you, you know you can do some really kind of granular searches and and get into or like if you want to want um a particular type of romance novel, you know, you want paranormal romance. You, you can, you can find that really easily and there's a ton at your disposable, uh, disposable, <laughs> disposal. <laughs> uh, whereas with, with the self-published music, we don't have that yet. Um, and so there's, you kind of have to either go to individual composers sites or go to these distributors. Like, you know, music spoke is, is a really good one. Um, uh, still fairly small, but they're growing quickly uh they're 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 solid people uh then there's sheet music plus that that does that will allow you to to do stuff but you know they're really big and the filters aren't great and it's all kind of weird um so yeah they're 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 some similarities in that like you keep this control and it's wonderful um but you also have to do all the work and then there are the differences in like discoverability and um yeah you know. yeah the discoverability yeah. seems like a major because i mean like that am I, I just put put out this book not too long ago in the in the fall and it's and just seeing and i had self-published a book 10 years ago too and even just to see the progress mm-hmm. in those 10 years right oh uh, crazy and, and being able to do it through amazon and and if you like you were saying if if you look professional i mean it's it's essentially indistinguishable from something coming out of yeah, uh, of a regular publishing house, right? And yeah. but then you have the advantage of the discoverability of Amazon, and even beyond that, it's like, man, you can get my book paperback, Kindle, Audible, right? Mm-hmm. And WhisperSync connected, right? Yeah, Which is yeah. like a, like a something out of a publishing house. And then we, if we go over to the music side, though, like, yeah, what? So Music Spoke is a site that you mentioned, mm-hmm. and then I've yeah. seen Music Plus. I'm familiar with. Mm-hmm. Where, d- what, what are the trends you're seeing in terms? I mean, is uh, how far? Because it still seems to me like if I want to look for music from a new composer, I mean, maybe I'll mm-hmm. go. I just feel like I'm randomly searching the internet. Like I'll go to oh, I know. New, new music box, you know, I follow along with mm-hmm. it, you know, so I might see something on there, but it's, I, yeah. Or if I'm looking for something for orchestra, I don't, I don't even know what, where to start. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rough. And, you know, I, I commend the music book people for, for the work they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, you know, they're trying to make this hub and actually, um, back in 2010, I, founded a company called new music shelf, Mm -hmm. um, that the whole point of it is to distribute, you know, electronic scores by self-published composers. And it, you know, I, I, it still is there. (laughs) It has been suffering from benign neglect for a while. I recently actually had some people, um, email me about coming on. Like it, it, I think it represents, it's either 25 or 50 composer, not 50, 25 or 30 composers, um, and like over 300 of their works. Um, so it, it grew fairly quickly. Um, and then it got to be too much work. And so I kind of let it, um, but I, (laughs) I just 
had a conversation uh, the other day about the site and I was lamenting the difficulties with it. And um, it just got my, the wheels turning again. And I mean, th- three, four years ago when I really kind of took a step back, put a moratorium on new composers, new works and all of that. Um, the, there, this, there wasn't a good solution to my problems yeah. you know, with the, with the software and everything. So I've, uh, I've actually just this past weekend figured out how to fix stuff. So I have to like, I have to drop some money on it, but, um, I'm actually going to revitalize the, the service relatively, you know, by the end of the year, it'll be back up and running. Um, so hopefully that will be another, uh, you know, place for people to, to find music. Okay, great. Nice. Yeah. That's uh and so, and that, and you're through that distributing digital, digital scores mm-hmm. and parts. Yeah. And, and, and that's something, so, you know, big, big topics that are uh, of concern to, you know, pe- people creating music uh, and the composers mm-hmm. and people just in this world like so i go to rent a michael doherty piece right mm-hmm. for my for my school orchestra and i rent it and it arrives in this big box and mm-hmm. i but if i hand out these rental parts to my students i they will instantly lose them because it's 2017 yeah. and papers devalued so mm-hmm. i go to the school copy or sorry michael doherty and i and i give the kids the copies and then we mm-hmm. give them, you know i try to be as ethical as i can but mm-hmm. so and and then i go rent like let's say pictures in an exhibition and i pay mm-hmm. uh 950 dollars for a school performance and we play two mm-hmm. events and the same thing that come the parts look like they're printed in like 1946 and yep. they're yellowing and falling <laughs> apart and just and like everything about this is like this business model does not seem to be the future you know like shipping giant boxes of paper so i so, know so i mean like but then the flip side is just like the ease i mean I, everybody can go to a copier anyway and make their mm-hmm. own pirate copies i guess but like how how do you sort of what what's your take or what what do you i don't i'm trying to formulate a question out of this problem but but like i i think i see where you're going yeah well, an, an interesting thing with this dichotomy in in the, the music world with, with uh, orchestra music it's like almost all rentals and that's yeah. kind of the only way you do it whereas in the band world you buy it right Right. And so it's yours and you can do it, do with it what you want. And there, yeah, there is this, this weird question. And in the, in the choral world, this is also an issue, um, you know, where you have to buy like 60 copies of a, of a piece yeah. and your students are going to lose half of them. Right. And it, so there's some teachers who will like, they'll buy their 60 copies. They have a copy for themselves and for all the students, but they lock all of those copies in a, filing cabinet they make 60 photocopies and yeah. pass those out and so they you know and then collect them at the end of, you know after the concert or, right. or, or at the end of the school year or whatever um and depending on who you talk to you know that's either totally okay or the worst thing in the world and you're taking you know bread from their mouths mm-hmm. um my opinion so long as you take it back and destroy them you're okay you know like if 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 you just if you, your original copies get destroyed, you should replace those. But it, you know, I'm kind of okay with with a, a limited degree of like making sure. Okay, we bought these copies, we have them, but we're not going to pass them out because, you know, we don't want to spend more money to replace them. Um, and so yeah, like that's kind of where I stand on that. <laughs> and I know that some people will vehemently disagree with me. Um. But I kind of think that we have to, everybody has to work together. So long, you know, people want to be, I know all these choral directors now are like, whereas they used to just photocopy everything, like now they're scrupulously careful about buying enough copies and, and, you know, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, yeah, with, uh, with digital stuff, um, the way that a lot of places, you know, do it is you buy like for new music shelf, um, you buy, um, copying licenses yeah so you you get the pdf and you have a license for you know 40 copies of this choral piece Mm -hmm. um and you know music spoke it's it's the same same way and i'm I'm pretty sure um sheet music plus as well and there's this there's a a degree of trust right that's involved and i had a, a composer on new music shelf um reasonably well known 
Um, she, some of her works were self-published. Some of them were, you know, traditionally published and she decided to, to join the site and give it a try. So she, she submitted like one piece, like with a really weird instrumentation and sort of like, I'll see how it sells. She didn't link to it from her website and you know, like sure. there was no, I got no traffic. And in the, the, the time that she was on the site, she made zero sales. And then some friend of hers, um, like got into her head that piracy is like scary Mm -hmm. and anybody could like just buy a copy of this and then share it with all their friends. So she, she asked for it to be taken down. So I took it down. But the thing is what is worse piracy or obscurity? Right. Right. Yes. (laughs) Like for your career. I mean, we, we don't want to be losing money to piracy like that. That's, that's, a, that's a given. We, we all have, you know, rent to pay and we have bills and we have to, you know, feed ourselves. Um, but for your career, there is a, there is a balancing, uh, thing of obscurity. Yeah. If, you know, if somebody shares it and they shouldn't, you know, bad on them, but if they share it, then that other person is, you know, possibly now, into what you do and they might go out and buy your, you know, your next scores and, you know, and, and, you know, evangelize for you. And that could be, that could lead to more sales and, and maybe some commissions. So there's, there are potential upsides, not to say that piracy is, is in any way good, but you can balance it. And the fact of the matter is if someone doesn't want to pay for something, they're not going to pay for it. They're either like, gonna get it for free somehow like illegally or they're just not going to buy it yeah. right and you you can't you're we're never going to escape those people they exist and so we you know we we do what we can to like minimize that by making things you know affordable mm-hmm. you know not like wildly overpricing things um you know being sort of respectful in pricing and, and not greedy. Um, but also acknowledging these, these people exist and this is what they, this is what they do. Right. Right. And it's like, like you said, it's like pl- the positives and uh, the negatives, obviously, but some positives too. And, and like the, the thing that I know you've talked about and like t- t- talking with you and Garrett t- uh, too, both about, but like the more people know, like, and trust you, right? The, the more mm-hmm. they're going, and the more you provide value to them, just these yeah. simple business concepts, of course, you know, the more, the more they're going to want to support what you do. Yeah. And, and, and th- that's, I, and there is, there is an element that's going to just, uh, take you know and mm-hmm. and that's possible in uh d- print it's possible with audio it's possible with yeah. you know everything and but if i, I believe you know pe- and people are people are decent by and large and they yeah. want to they want to support a good thing and mm-hmm. and so it's like trying to find that find that balance where you're not you're yeah you know sustaining your your business but but yeah. making sure that the the safe isn't too tightly closed mm-hmm. yeah with that composer who who left new music shelf um you know i i kind of wanted to you know i just sort of like said okay fine and and did it and that was that but i sort of wanted to push her a little bit and say you know i know that your stuff is available like some scores are available through your regular publishers at the New York public library, Mm -hmm. I could go there, you know, check out a score, bring it to Kinko's, make 10,000 copies and paper the upper West side with it. Right. You know, it's still possible with the, you know, with paper scores, it's going to cost me money to do it, but it's still, it's still possible to, to, to do that. And, you know, so I, 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 I get questions and I know that music spoke and and various sites get questions about like digital rights management, DRM. And do you do that? Like, do you limit how many times people can print it? It's like, why are you treating your customers or why would I treat my customers like thieves? Right. Right. Like to start with, why, why do I start that relationship with, okay, give me your money, but I still don't trust you. Yeah. And anybody who's who's thinking about that, I, I would encourage them to go back and listen to like Steve Jobs' d- mm-hmm. uh, d- description of why Apple decided to take DRM away from mm-hmm. the iTunes Store. Anybody who's our age or or older and is 
bought things from iTunes in the early days. Yeah. Remember, it's like everything was locked down. And any yeah. sort of DRM kind of exists to be broken. And all it does mm-hmm. is make it a pain in the neck for the people who are trying to do the right thing. You know, then exactly. like, oh, I got a new iPhone. None of my music will play because the stinking, mm-hmm. you know, this or that. And yeah, yeah, I yeah. can't play it on my Android phone or, you know, oh, I don't have the software to unlock this PDF. Yeah. How do I do that? Can what? What do I do if, if I can't do this? It, right. It's it's a hindrance, and it doesn't help anybody in the end. Mm-hmm. I love so I, you were before the podcast. You were you were doing these blog posts, like mm-hmm. a business sca- and what? Can you can, give me, remind me the name one more time? It was like uh, the comp- sca- uh, yeah, the composer's guide to doing business, which is now I have a second podcast, and that's yeah. the title of that as well. Right. So okay. there, I have this whole like trajectory for for that particular name that will turn into a book at some point (laughs) sweet sweet. good i can't wait to can't can't wait to see that evolve like how did you develop these business skills i mean you went to went to music school at illinois state and at Mm. at what point in this journey did you start to uh think about composing as a business or develop those skills in yourself uh it's sort of a, a couple of different things brought help to, to make that happen. Um, I, my dad's a CPA, so mm-hmm. I kind of have, and I was going to do accounting <laughs> in undergrad. So I kind of have a, a little bit of a ability to work with numbers and to think about, you know, you know, I'm, I'm good at making spreadsheets and stuff. Okay. Um, but then when I moved to the city, I studied with, um, with that composer, Darren Hagen, mm-hmm. and he, um, a significant part of our lessons was actually, learning about this stuff where he would sort of explain the way some of the, the industry worked. And, um, I would, you know, he would sometimes take calls from other people in the business. You know, if he was negotiating a commission or, you know, dealing with an upcoming performance and the person called during my lesson, he took it. And, you know, rather than saying, Oh, I'm in a lesson right now, he was, he would say, before he picked up the phone, he'd say, Oh, this is so-and-so you should listen to, listen to this. Mm -hmm. And so I got to see him working like that. And then I became his assistant. And, uh, so I did a lot of filing for him, um, which was fantastic because that meant that I got to read a lot of this stuff that, that I was filing, you know, seeing contracts and, and all of that. And then listening to these podcasts and reading, uh, blogs like Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith and Joe Conrath. Those are three writers who really have helped to pioneer the the self-publishing movement, the indie publishing movement. Um, you know, reading their stuff and then, you know, listening to the, the various podcasts that, that really started to get my wheels turning and got me really thinking about how do I port that to music? Mm-hmm. And I feel like about 5% of the ideas that I put out in, in my podcasts are in any way original. <laughs> the rest are just, you know, it, I'll take something from somewhere else and synthesize it into, you know, something that's appropriate for, for music. And, you know, people think, Oh my God, this is so, so wildly new. I'm like, no, it's really old. (laughs) You just didn't know about it. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it was a lot of that. And then kind of diving in, um, I ran a a concert series in Manhattan for about five years. And so, you know, having to budget for that and think about licensing and, just all, all the moving parts, uh, hiring musicians, mm-hmm. it just, uh, it started to, to, to click and, and every, every new endeavor that I, you know, start out on, I have to learn new skills and then I want to like impart those. <laughs> so yeah. that, that kind of, that drove a lot of the, the writing was, um, in part, this is what I've learned and in part forcing me to learn more things to teach it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that that the the, the phrase, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal, comes to mind. Yeah. You know, like like that. <laughs> I, 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 I shudder to think if I've ever put out an original idea in my life, but but I've put out many <laughs> original synthesis of, of other people's yeah. ideas, and yeah, and that's yeah. what we've been doing for thousands of years. You know, at this mm-hmm. at this point. So, and, and I'll, I'll certainly uh, incur, I'll link up to everything we're talking about and, and obviously both <laughs> podcasts, but maybe 
and and it's such a big topic, right? Like mm-hmm. developing some business acumen as a as a musician, mm-hmm. but it's so critical, you know. To, I know, to, I know. Uh, to anybody who doesn't isn't lucky enough, or 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 whatever you want to call it, to land a full time university job, orchestra job, whatever. The few and mm-hmm. far between, and ever shrinking full time jobs. Yeah, Oof. but but like, where do you even begin? Maybe maybe a good question f- f- to sort of frame this is like. Could you name maybe like a couple of your episodes that people listening to this should start with to just kind of like get get their oh, f- get their feet going in terms of the business side? That's a good question. Um, let me see. Let me just pull up my episodes here and see what <laughs> what stands out at me. Um, episode one, despite the uh, the crazy audio with mm-hmm. Alex Shapiro, mm-hmm. just so we sort of talk about the business mindset. Yeah. Um, and, and what that, what that means and, and why you should think about your career as, as a business in some way. Yeah. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Episode seven with Dale Trimbor. Okay. Um, we talk about like taking a methodical approach to your career, not, you know, just sort of going out and going, I'm going to do everything, but sort of doing things methodically and doing them well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being um, strategic in the way that you think about your career instead of just ah. yeah, right. um, <laughs> which which is so easy to do. I, yeah. I do it too. <laughs> um, and then uh, episode twelve with Thomas de Neuville is a good one, okay? Um, because we talk about like social networking, email marketing, kind of web presence stuff, and how to to operate with that, which is something that I think a lot of us are a little. We know we need to do it, and but we don't necessarily know why, and we certainly don't know how. Yeah, yeah. So I think those are three really good, really good um, starting places. There's you know a lot of other things here sure. that that would I think appeal. Um, and then, then episode thirty five with Scott Teggy. That one is a good one about okay. diversified income streams. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. Well, which is which is another you know. Thing that that not just people in the music world are doing more and more mm-hmm. of um, the, the sort of like the future economic reality for most of us. Uh, yeah, and, and I love that it's in podcast form like that. Like anybody l- who's listening, check out the links in the show notes and listen to those while you're on a walk or doing the dishes or driving. And that's a good. <laughs> these are crucial things, even if you think you're going to end up in a full-time orchestra or full-time university mm-hmm. position you it's still the some of my f- favorite players who are in in positions like that are still doing something entrepreneurial on the side mm-hmm. and, and that might be the thing yeah. they're most passionate about so just having mm-hmm. a little bit of sense uh yeah. in the business world is a is a valuable thing i've got a question for you have you gone back and ever spoken at illinois state i have what um, what did you speak about i, I think it'd be fascinating well, I have a, I, I, before, let's see, before the podcasts, mm-hmm. um, when I was still just, uh, blogging, uh, I, they commissioned an orchestra piece from me and I, I was in residency for a week. And so I created this lecture that I've done again, um, there and that I really want to do at a lot of other places. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. That's, that's a thing that I want to do in terms of like diversified income streams, like, guest lecture at places. Um, but I have this, this lecture called making a career in the arts. And so I've, I've spoken to, you know, big swaths of just the college of fine arts in general with, with that. And, you know, I've, I've done master classes with their composers and with their singers and, you know, like the, the, the school of theater really likes me too. Cause I worked a lot with them when I was there. Mm-hmm. So various and sundry of their, professors will invite me to speak to like the theater management class or, you know, you know, various, you know, various people will say, Hey, you know, why don't you talk to my students <laughs> and give them idea, an idea of what it's like to be, you know, a full-time musician out in, in, in the world. And it, I love it. I love talking to students and, you know, answering their questions and sort of giving them a little, a dose of reality laced with hope <laughs> what are, what are some of the maybe the, some of the aha moments or common maybe misconceptions that you find people have about making a career in the music are there any things that keep coming up when you when you do those talks well one important part of the the talks um that 
I think has a bigger effect on the faculty mm -hmm. than on the students. I mean, the, the students, I think, are starting to are starting to understand the nature of, of what what the nature of their careers will be, and that it um, it'll be sort of a patchwork career. Yeah. You know, that's that's the way things are. You know, you you do this diversified income thing, and you um, you know your, your career isn't necessarily linear you're you're over here doing this and you're over there doing that and so long as you're moving forward that's good um it it, it i know i know that helps them to for me to talk about that and and to really sort of lay it out and say you know the people that you're studying with you know they're fantastic but they they learned a particular idea about how careers should work and it's a you you do your undergrad you do your master's you know well at least for composers you know do your master's do your doctorate and then you teach you know for for many it's also you know you win this award and then you win that award and then you do this and then you do that and at a certain point you have become successful mm -hmm. once you you tick off these boxes as a pianist you win these competitions and as a composer you you know you win these awards and once you've done those things you've ticked off those boxes um you know you've gotten your orchestra gig or whatever you are now successful but that's kind of not how it works anymore you there there are a few people that still do that but it there it, there's so few like only one person can win the the van Cliburn right. a year you know <laughs> and so that path is extremely limited so if you're if you're a pianist you know, you have to find other ways to to make your career work, and you might have to hustle a little harder in in other ways. But it will probably be more rewarding. So the whole idea of having a a nonlinear sort of patchwork career mm -hmm. rather than a point A, point B, point C, point D until like you are successful and you've made it. And then there's also the question of what then. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you you got the orchestra gig at you know thirty seven. What now? That's a good. Qu that's a question that my favorite artists continue to a continue mm -hmm. to ask into their fifties, their sixties, their seventies. Some of yep. my favorite, my favorite and most active and creative musicians that I see right now, Barry Green's a great example. The guy who wrote the Inner Game of Music. It's like, what's the next project? I've been doing this for. I've got this thing. I work on it for a year or two. Mm -hmm. I move on to the next project. Some of these other people, people who listen to my podcast, like Francois Raboth, He's eighty five. He's doing the same thing. I want to mm -hmm. be like that when I'm eighty five. Mm -hmm. I want to be moving on to the next thing i don't want to have gotten my job i never did get the job so but like i don't want to have gotten the job i got at 37 to be the same mm -hmm. thing i'm doing when i'm you know 63 yeah that's that even if i did those those positions are are flatlining or shrinking uh mm -hmm. but and there are some real positives to having a non-linear career i think i think mm -hmm. one, of, one of the challenges is just feeling can it, it can be so easy to be kind of disconnected and yeah. and even in this world of social media, like you brought up social media and, and and showing our successes to the world and that sort of thing, it can really be a kind of it kind of feel like you're just sort of like spinning around in a in a circle. Mm -hmm. Just you know how how do you again? This might be like an impossible question, but how do you? <laughs> kind of ground yourself in your career and, and move forward in your career, just kind of given the sort of scattered nature of, of what we are, what we're doing. Oh, well, one way is actually by doing different things. Yeah. Um, I find that, um, just going back a little bit to the patchwork idea. Um, I do find that, you know, I have to, I, by, by doing other things, you know, I, I do web design, I do, um, music engraving and, you know, all these things, they, they put me in contact with, with new people yeah. in new ways. So like I, my design, my, my web design stuff is mostly for me mus musicians. So mm -hmm. I've met a lot of like really important composers by pitching to them to like design their, their website or by actually redesigning their website. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that sort of, that helps by doing all these different things. It, because I'm over here and I'm over there and I'm just doing like seven different types of things it's, it can be really easy to sort of head down and, you know, just do the things, but the scattered nature of it makes me sort of take us, take a step back periodically and have that forward, you know, view. 
yeah. to say, okay, web design is the, like, it's gotten me some great opportunities. Is it still getting me great opportunities or is it just getting me a paycheck every so often? And is the paycheck enough? Do I need to stop doing that and put my energies somewhere else to, to keep moving forward and not to stagnate? Yeah. Because it can be easy to stagnate when you're doing all these different things. They can help you move forward in like bizarre ways or maybe not forward, but sideways and yeah. get you someplace that you never could have been before. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I try to, to take stock every so often and, and, you know, reevaluate the things that I'm doing and how I'm doing them. And is this working? Is this getting, am I at least moving forward? Mm -hmm. If I'm not, if I'm just sort of in the same place, that's not great. And I absolutely do not want to move backward. I love that, I, that concept of, of taking stock of what you're doing. That's mm. so great because like we did, and, <laughs> and, and whether it's, it's somebody, whether it's practicing or composing mm -hmm. or writing or podcasting or anything, I think that's such a valuable thing. Just because you're doing something, you've been doing something, sometimes you just get the inertia of something going. It doesn't necessarily oh, yeah. mean that it's what you should be pouring your time into. It's just like a thing that's like, you're just kind of like yeah. rolling along every week. Yeah, the uh, a big thing. It's it's almost a joke now. It's like a drinking game on the self publishing podcast. Um, they they have this phrase: know your why. Yeah. Whenever you do something, know why you're doing it. You know it. If like they they've written a, a this this one book, and it's really easy for them to write a sequel to that book. But why are they doing that? Are they doing it because they've they've laid the groundwork and it's easy to do it? Um, or are they doing it because their fans want it and they want to do it too? Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, they, they have to answer these questions. Why, why am I continuing it th with this series or why, why am I continuing to do this thing and work in this side business? Is it advancing me? Is it not, is it just a thing that I do now? And it's not, and the benefit isn't there beyond maybe a little paycheck. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that's a big, you know, know your why is kind of, one of the things that that helps to propel me forward or at least try to keep me from not stagnating too much yeah. um and 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 have that longer view because if i don't know where i want to be you know I, I can't take i can't take stock and see know your why i love that and and, and you know for me <laughs> if i if for me if if i i've asked that many times of things i've done and if the mm -hmm. answer is just money that's pro mm -hmm. you really want to reevaluate that be, be, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've definitely, I've definitely <laughs> said that as I'm driving to gigs. I'm not going to name now. Like, mm -hmm. why am I money? Oh, okay. Let's yeah. <laughs> maybe. Which can, which can be totally legit. You know, yeah, you have to pay your bills, sure. but also, you know, one of the, the one way that you can look at the gigs you do, there's the one, there are the ones that you really want to do, but they don't pay well. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other ones that, um, did I say that right? The ones yeah. you want to do and don't pay well. Right. The ones that do pay well, but you're not really into. Right. The ones that pay well can help to subsidize those other things. So maybe your why is, yeah, there, there's a paycheck and it allows me to take this other fulfilling work that can help to yeah. move me forward in that area. So, uh, favorite, uh, <laughs> uh, the Lance LeDuc and Andrew Hitz have this podcast, The Brass Junkies, which I occasionally mm -hmm. pop in on, uh, though I'm not a <laughs> brass player. I like, I like the rapport. And I think Lance has a line, like, if, if you, when you're evaluating a gig, it ha you have to get two of the following three criteria. It has to pay well, be musically mm -hmm. satisfying, or a good hang. So it has to be, th your, yeah. you like the people. Two of the three have to be met. If it's only mm -hmm. a good hang... Yeah. If it only yeah. pays well, if it's only musically good, you know, which, mm -hmm. which I, I can't think of too many that are musically good and don't pay well and are a good hang, but I, there's probably something. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, I can think of a couple, but I think of well, Dennis, th this is awesome. We got to do a round two at some point. I want to be respectful yeah. of your time. And I, I mean, this is yeah. so, but I, these are the kind of topics I love digging into. I, I've yeah. got one more question th that, and, and there's so many, uh, Final questions I could ask, but I was just keep thinking about Illinois State, and I thought like mm -hmm. maybe if you could hang a plaque in the music mm -hmm. building of Illinois State, all the students mm -hmm. are walking by for them to mm -hmm. see something to plant in their subconscious every day. What might you hang? Oh God, <laughs> I know. Like what? What kind of plaque? <laughs> uh, let's let's get let's let, it, it can only uh, one sentence or less. I would say. You know, it's not, I wouldn't, not really equipped, but you know, 
be a good musical citizen. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's it. That's it's good. a concept that that drives that really drives a lot of what I do. That's a gr- that's a great concept. I and I can think I immediately the moment you said that I think of a lot of times that I have been and have not been a good musical mm-hmm. citizen. I mean, these days <laughs> I think I'm a b- much better musical citizen with the podcast mm-hmm. and everything. But I, I, I like that. I like that, especially like I'm thinking of like 18 year old, 19 year old Jason. That would have been an mm-hmm. interesting thing to. Uh, nice. That's yeah, great. It, it, yeah, it, it forces you, I think, to take stock of the people around you and how you can interface and, and do good work. Yeah. Keeping the focus, not on you, on the on mm-hmm. others, the, the community, yeah. how can you be a good part of the, you mm-hmm. know, that's, that's beautiful, man. Thank you so much. Just uh, congratulations oh, on the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So much fun talking to Dennis music, publishing podcast.com. And Dennis, of course, you can find him at DennisTabensky.com. If you're new to the show, this is your first episode, or if you've been listening for hundreds of episodes, first of all, thank you for being along. And we do all sorts of different things on this podcast. Most of the time we're talking to bass players, but not always. If there's somebody that I think would be interesting for all the folks that listen to this, I love having them on. So it was great to have Dennis on the show. Thank you, Dennis, for taking the time. And if you dig this show, share it out, folks. It would mean the world to me. I know I would appreciate it. Dennis would appreciate it. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Twitter. Email it to a friend. Whatever you want to do to help spread the word about this show. That's how this DIY indie kind of medium works. Thanks again to Upton and the Bass Violin Shop. So great to have them on board. And so great to have you on board as we do a week all revolving around non-bass players, but of topics that I know are of interest to everybody, including you bass players. So thanks again for listening. We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>